This interview is with Robert Hamm of Urbana, Illinois. It's taking place August 23rd, 2007 uh, in the WILL studio in Campbell Hall on the campus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, I'm the interviewer. My name is Kathleen Ricker and I'm from Champaign, Illinois. Uh, so, tell us about uh, how you ended up getting into the Navy. Well, like I said, I was about, <laughs> I, I think I was about 19, and I was going to get drafted. I got a draft notice, and I wasn't too happy about going in the, na in the Army. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, in the Navy you got three meals a day and a good place to sleep anyway. So I went down to sign up in the Navy and went down to the recruiting office. And when they, they asked me where I worked, and I told them I worked in an engineering plant. And it, it was hot water boilers. And right away they got excited about that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they said, we want you, but we can't take you in. We're signed up, I don't know what it was, three or four months ahead of time. They couldn't handle any more people at Great Lakes. They, I had, I'd have to wait my time. And I told them, well, the Army's on my tail and they're gonna nail me if I don't go in the Navy. So they said, well, we'll take care of that. So all I did was go home and they said, we'll give you a call when you should come down. So it was <laughs> it was about six months later, I got a few notices from the Army and I guess they was looking for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I kept referring them back to the, to the Navy recruiting office and I didn't hear from them anymore. And Finally, the Navy said, okay, come on down, we'll, you, we'll induct you. So I come down and took a physical and was sworn in. But the thing was, when I signed up, they asked me if I wanted to join the Navy or the Reserve. They said the Reserve Navy was duration and six months. So I said, well, I'll take a duration in six months. I don't want to hang in any longer than I have to. So that's what they signed me up for. And I got shipped over to uh, Great Lakes. And I did my boot camp up there. And after I got out of boot camp, they, they sent me down to Norfolk, Virginia, and I went on a battleship. The real antique, or it was the old New York, uh, and it was, <laughs> like I say, it was a real antique battleship. It was from World War One, and what they was doing was, it was con uh, what would you call it, in convoys going over to Africa, to uh, Casablanca, and. Uh, I made one of them, one trip there, and when I come back, <clears throat> we uh, ended up getting transferred to the Franklin. It was a brand new aircraft carrier, and it hadn't even been commissioned yet. So I went to pre-commissioning school, and uh, I was a, a plank owner on it which meant that I was the original crew, part of the original crew. And we went on a shakedown to Trinidad and come back to Norfolk and then down through the Panama Canal and over to San Diego. And there we picked up our air group and our planes and headed for Pearl Harbor. 
But um, can I just stop you here just a second? What year was this? What was the time frame? What year? Uh, it would be in forty two. Okay. <clears throat> and um, you were headed to Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Well, they they was using this thing as a, the carrier as a brand new carrier. And uh, as long as we was going to Pearl Harbor, they, want, they loaded the thing out of the ship up with all kinds of supplies, munitions, everything they could throw on there, on the hangar deck and flight deck. We didn't have any planes on. And uh, we went to uh, Pearl Harbor, and they unloaded us, and we got our air group on and our planes on, and it was out what for gunnery practice and and uh in fact we tied up right next to the old arizona the the mast and the the uh bridge of the arizona was still on on the ship they hadn't taken it off so uh you could look down and see the gun turrets and everything still on it now i think they're you can look down and you know, all you see is a big round hole. That was probably the 16-inch gun turret. <clears throat> well, anyway, we, we took our pilots on and, and planes on, and we hung around there for several weeks for gunnery practice. And before we finally took off, we took off. I don't remember exactly well, I, when we got there, the captain passed the word. He says, we're going to uh, have a 4th of July party. It was the 4th of July, and we bombed uh, Iwo Jima. It was their first, first mission. <coughs> and uh, from there, like I say, I don't remember the exact details as to where we went from there. I think we went to Saipan, but we hit, we was engaged in uh, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Incidentally, when when we was at, at, at uh, Iwo Jima, that's in the Bolin Islands. Uh, old uh, President Bush had just got shot down up there. I think he was bombing Tinian. No, he was bombing, uh, it was, which was a weird name, Ha Ha Chi Chi and Jima, Iwo Jima, Ha Ha Chi Chi and Iwo Jima was the three islands they were bombing. And uh, he got shot down and was picked up by a submarine. And uh, and we went on down to the Marianas. And we was there for softening up of, of, uh, of the Marianas and it, the invasion. And then we went to, uh, yeah, boy, I don't know where he went next. That was one problem he had when he was in engineering. He was down on the bottom of the ship. He never seen where he was going or what was going on. <laughs> but uh, I was down in the fire room, in the engine room. Mm -hmm. And one thing I do remember about <laughs> about some of the action was uh, occasionally we'd uh, run across a submarine out there. And we had a guy that was up on the, they call it the smoke watch. He, he sat in a, a little thing up, way up on the, the top, tallest part of the ship, and he could look down on the stacks. The uh, boilers had, each boiler had a division in the stack, and he was called a smoke watch. And if any of the boilers were smoking any, he'd holler down, he had, uh, they called them JV phones, he'd holler down to the fire room and say, hey, you know, number four boiler or five boilers is smoking like gray. 
So the guy on the, on the blowers would turn the blowers up and, and eliminate the smoke or the, the gray. But anyway, occasionally he'd say, hey, you know, you got a torpedo coming in on, on, the, <laughs> on the port side. <laughs> And everybody in the fire room would run over to the starboard side. Not that it would do any good, but he figured, <laughs> hey, we're a little further away. Yeah. And, uh... Did that, that happen frequently? Pardon? Did that happen a lot? Oh, yeah, several times. And a lot of times the, the captain would give the order, you know, for hard rudder, rudder. And they'd flip the thing over and it would go past the bow or past the stern. But we never get hit by one. And uh, we went after after the Marianas, I think we went to the Philippines. It was in the Philippine Sea at Mindanao and Leyte. Trying to think. Oh, yeah. Uh, my cousin was in the Marine Corps. He was from Chicago also, and uh, he was sent to the Palu Islands. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, he was, we, we had gone in and we were softening up the Palu Islands for invasion. And after we bound up for several days, the uh, okay. I found out later my cousin was in the first wave and he was killed. But they had sent word back to us. We we was heading down toward the Admiralty Islands. The invasion went real good, mm -hmm. and <laughs> it's why I don't like to talk about it. No, no, it isn't. It never is. Anyway. We went down there, we crossed the equator, and we got our shell back cards. And uh, after, as soon as we got across the equator, we got word that the Japanese had, had turned the Marines back, mm -hmm. and they drove them off the island. And uh, then the army came in, and 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 a pretty good large force, and they they come back and reoccupied it, and, and took it over. And it was about. A month later, I found out that my cousin had been killed. Okay. And then we come up and we was in the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And that was when the Jap fleet was hiding in the Philippines, and they came out, and we nailed them as they came out. They they call it the Mariana Turkey Shoot. They really tore them up. We we had uh, we had get, <clears throat> we got hit once 
uh, by the deck edge elevator. Uh, it was, I don't think it actually hit us. It was a real close miss. It, it killed several people and wounded a bunch of the fellows. And, and uh, it did a little damage to the deck edge elevator. And um, I don't remember how many, there was several killed at that time. And uh, we later, I don't exactly remember exactly where we were at, but we got hit by a kamikaze. He come right down through the flight deck and crashed into the, into the armored uh, hangar deck. And that was, we got sort of pretty good there. And he, uh, we went back to, I think it was Ulithi. And Halsey, oh, uh, he came aboard and uh, to see how much damage we had. And he decided we, we better go back to the States. He couldn't take care of it there in uh, Ulithi or Pearl Harbor. So we went back to uh, uh, Seattle, not Seattle, Washington, uh, Bremerton, Washington, in Puget Sound. <clears throat> yeah, what happened then? We, we was there, well, we was there over Christmas and everybody got to leave. And we had a, a wild train ride from Seattle to Chicago. We was like on a cattle car, or cattle train. It was an antique train. It had old leather seats, and not oh, leather, wow. uh, straw seats like they used to have in the streetcars in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It was so old. And we had a pot-bellied stove to keep warm. And it was so cold, and it was coming through the mountains, the guys were tearing the seats up and burning them in the, in the pot-bellied stove. Oh, wow. <laughs> really, first-class accommodations. <laughs> and uh, then we went back after our leave. We had, I think it was 20-day leave. We went back uh, to Bremerton, and uh, they had the ship finished in, in a couple of months. And we went back down to San Francisco and San Diego and took on a new air crew. And we got some new missiles. They'd never been used before. They was called Tiny, Tiny Tims. And uh, we loaded up with them and went back out. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, we didn't really know where we was going, or at least the engineering people didn't. And uh, we, we found out later that we was going to hit and bomb Japan. And we was the first carrier planes to bomb the mainland of Japan since Jimmy Doolittle didn't. <laughs> he was he had the, the big uh, army bombers and they took off of a carrier. And uh, anyway, we was the first ones to, uh, to hit since he had hit. We had been bombing it with, with people from uh, I think it was Guam or Saipan. I'm not sure where they came from. But uh, the big army bombers had been bombing Japan for quite a while. But we was one of the first carrier groups to, to hit it. And this would have been in 1943 then, is that? No, that was in 1945. Uh, oh, 1945, okay. Yeah. But anyway, we're, I don't want to get into the details of that. Okay. But we got a, a Japanese bomber. We was 50 miles off the, Jap the coast of Japan. Mm -hmm. 
And we were, our planes were all loaded, fully loaded with bombs, gas, and these new tiny Tims, both on the hangar deck and the flight deck. And a uh, jet bomber dropped two bombs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And all these planes and the pilots on the hangar deck and flight deck got blown away. And we had a total of about 800 people killed and four or 500 wounded. <laughs> And the Santa Fe cruiser came up alongside of us and took the wounded off. And then the worst part. Was burying the guys. After that, after we, well, we, we stopped at Ulithi and there was something there was a little argument over. It was the captain, I remember him hollering, all our, I, I was down in the mess hall and my battle station was on a repair, par, repair party Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we, we started looking for bodies. It took us a long time. There wasn't really any bodies left. There were just pieces. <laughs> well, we went back to Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and like I say, I'm not gonna say what I wanted to say about the captain. But uh, as they say, leave sleeping dogs lie. Okay. It, it wasn't good. But we went back down through the canal and up through the Gulf. And I don't know how true it was, but uh, The word was that there was a German submarine operating in the Gulf, and we should really watch out for it. And the captain passed word. He said if he's going to follow the coastline all the way around Florida, and if he got a torpedo, he was going to run that sucker up on the beach. <laughs> they wasn't going to sink it. <laughs> but anyway, we, we got back up to New York, and that picture we had there, that was the, the dance we had mm -hmm. that Lady Astor put on. So while, while we was in New York, the war in Europe was over, and I was on Times Square when that happened, and shortly afterwards, the war in Japan was over, and I was on Times Square when that happened. And uh, New York was a good town to be in when the war was over, I'll tell you that. And a couple of buddies of mine, we decided, well, the war's over. 
and all we're doing is sitting around here in New York, and we, we wasn't discharged yet. So we signed up for uh, bringing the troops back from, from Europe. And we get, they told us, well, there's a German luxury liner that they're, trans they're converting to a troop ship, and we would be on that. Mm -hmm. So they sent us to school to learn German, because <laughs> all, all uh, the uh, gauges and everything, valves and everything else was numbered in, and written in German, and we couldn't figure out what was what. And uh, we had to learn all that. And about the time we got, got halfway learned on that, they uh, said, hey, we're getting transferred to another carrier. So uh, we which got would on be the, English. the Lake Champlain, which was the exact same carrier that the Franklin was. And uh, it was weird. We, they, they put us on the, it was the same ship. They put us down in number three fire room, which is the fire room we was in. So everything was perfect. We knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we made it a trip over to Southampton, England. And we went from Southampton to uh, Staten Island. And the second time, on our second trip, right after we pulled out of Southampton, it was about 18 hours out of Southampton, I got an attack of appendicitis. <laughs> oh. And we was out there in the North Atlantic and it was pretty rough. And so the guy that operated on me was a captain. And uh, he, he did a real, real good job and finished up just before we got into New York, I guess. He's, we was probably out about three or four days when he operated on me. And uh, got my appendix out and I couldn't do nothing for a couple of weeks. So they put me on light duty. And they said, well, as long as you can't do nothing, why don't you take a leave? So I thought, well, this is cool. I'll take it. And uh, come to find out, I didn't have any money, <laughs> so I couldn't go home. And uh, I went to, uh, who was it? Um, I don't remember who it was now. One of the, one of the uh, one of the outfits that they told us to go see. You know, if we needed emergency money or something, and they turned me down. And I went to they, I went to the uh, Salvation Army, and they lent me the money. So I got home, and uh, I think I had eight days leave. Went home and they, uh, I got the money, and when I, eight days I flew back and pay, and paid them off. And uh, about that time, I got my discharge. Come back to Chicago. And that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> it's quite a nutshell. Huh? I said it's quite a nutshell. Yeah. So what did you do after you were discharged? Well, I, I went back to the engineering company I worked for. And... I was really throwing a lot of money at me. I think I was making about 40 cents an hour uh, assembling boilers. And uh, a friend of ours worked for Santa Fe Railroad, and he says, hey, why don't you come down and sign up on the railroad? Mm -hmm. So I went down there and uh, got on an old steam locomotives. That, they still had steam ones. And in the yard, I worked in the yard on the south side. And uh, I worked there for a while, and it was pretty dangerous. There was 
a lot of casualties in the, in the yard. There was no lights out there, and, and uh, people were always getting hit by cars, or box cars and stuff going by with, you know, just, there was hundreds of tracks and you couldn't hear them guys, the trains coming, you know, they were just switching. And uh, I f finally decided I better get out of there. And uh, in the meantime, I got married and we had uh, three sons and moved to Urbana. I worked over to Unibai, Unibai for a while. Where did you work? Well, I, what, what I tried to do when, when uh, we were still in Chicago, my, my father-in-law got me into the carpenters union and he took me under his wing and uh, showed me the ropes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I went to apprentice school, and uh, I worked there probably four or five years as as a carpenter. <laughs> and then uh, my cousin, who lived in Urbana, said, "You know, why don't you get out of Chicago and come on down here?" So I thought, "Well, that's a good idea." And uh, apply for a, a job at the university. Mm -hmm. So I tried to get on as a carpenter and they uh, had a very, I don't know how they had very limited amount of people, you know, carpenters and plumbers and electricians and bricklayers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if there was any big jobs, they always subbed it out to, you know, private contractors. So all the all, uh, their permanent staff were just doing, you know, small jobs on the, on the campus. But uh, I was nearly got on a couple of times. I took the could, took the exams and uh, everything was fine. And they said, you know, we're all ready to go to work. Mm -hmm. Come down and uh, we'll show you your lockers and all that stuff. And they asked me if I had my physical yet, and I said no. I said, go over to the university hospital and get your physical. And I went over there, and I hate to say it, <laughs> but he was a very old doctor. And he looks at me and he says, you can't get on as carpenter. He said, that's too strenuous. And he said, you might get a hernia. And I said, "Do I have one?" And he said, "No, but you might get one." And that was that was it. I never got on. Oh. And then a couple of years later, I worked there as a janitor. A couple of years later, I went over to the powerhouse, the Abbott. I guess it's Abbott Powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And I checked in with the superintendent there, and he says. Our best guys are old Navy men. He says, we could use you. So I just filled out the application, and he looked at it, and he says, oh no. I said, what's the matter now? And he says, you're too old. So, yeah, that was a long time ago. They can't do that today, I guess. But anyway, that blew the job on the boilers there at the power plant. So I went back into the carpenter work and I, I had my own company for several years here in Champaign-Urbana. And uh, we built a lot of houses here and worked on, through the union, worked on a lot of uh, university buildings. And then I moved down to Oakland and um, bought a little track of land. I think it had 20 acres of, it was all wooded. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of oak trees and, and uh, a few walnuts and, and uh, hickories and, and maples. And uh, 
I, I built a, uh, a kiln to dry lumber in. And there was a guy down the road from us that had a portable sawmill. So uh, I had him cut up a lot of the trees into boards, and they built this kiln, and I could I could dry 3,000 feet of lumber in that, and uh, I, I'd make it into into trim uh, case and bases and stuff like that. And I did that for several years. And my boys helped me on that. And then we got tired of that and moved back to Urbana. <laughs> One of the boys decided he wanted to buy the place and he just took over. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we come back up to Urbana. We was down there about 30 years, and now we've been up here in Urbana about going on five years. That pretty well lines it up. So you said that you you uh, do go back for reunions. Yeah, we have. When we first started out, I went to our first reunion in New York. In fact, I went to the reunion. And while I was at the reunion, this guy here that brought me today was born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my wife said that she was going to wait till I come back before she had it, and she didn't make it. He was born on July 3rd, and she sent me a telegram that that I was a, a daddy again. <laughs> and. Uh, that was the first reunion we had. And that would have been 10, About 20, 40. Oh, 40. Let's see, what would that be? About 48, 49. Okay. And now, uh, let's see, where are we? We're back in Urbana. And, and um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Which is pretty easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then how many, about how many years apart were the reunions? Well, we started out probably six or eight years apart. And uh, it took a long time to, you know, try to get a hold of all the guys. Mm -hmm. That was something I, d I didn't tell you about, too, was when we got hit, the captain told everybody that was not essential to running the ship to leave the ship. And that's when the Santa Fe come up alongside and took the wounded and all unessential personnel off. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like the anybody in the air division or any anything that didn't have anything to do with running a ship. Mm -hmm. So when, when he ended up, we had 704 guys left out of about 3,200. And uh, they called that the 704 Club. And then after we got back to, he, well, I better not get into that <laughs> about the people that uh, left the ship. He uh, he said that no one that left the ship could come back. And we had uh, one of my buddies was up on the flight deck when it hit, and he got blowed off. Mm-hmm. And he got picked up by a destroyer, and they took him back to Pearl Harbor. And when we got back to Pearl Harbor, uh, me and another guy that was down in number three fire room, we heard that the guy's name was Loudon, 
that he had been blown off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, he didn't leave the ship. He was blown off the ship. And uh, we went down on the dock at Pearl Harbor. And we had a, a jeep assigned to us. And we, it was a Marine that was doing the driving. And we told him, hey, we got to go over and get Bob Lawton. He's over here someplace at the, I think it was on the air base there. And the Marine said, yeah, I know where they're at. So we snapped up the Jeep and went over to the air base. And the guy with the PA system out in the middle of the field was called out for Bob Lawton to come over. And he came over and we told him, hey, we're, you're going back on the ship. And we, we brought him back. And he was, <clears throat> he had some shrapnel in him. And we spent about a week picking shrapnel out of his back. <laughs> it was basically specks of of paint and debris. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, he was, after after the war was over, when he, when he got discharged, he told this other guy that was with me, St. Lawrence, he said uh, he would never come to the reunion. And we said, why not? And he said that when, when he was in Pearl Harbor, because he was an engineer, he, and he left the ship, the guys were spitting on him. Oh, no. <coughs> and he never got over that. That's a very cruel and fair yep. thing to have happen. Yeah, it was a lot of hard feelings. And then the thing was, after we got hit, all, a lot of the officers that took off because they weren't essential officers. When we got to Ulithi, the captain sent over there and told him, you know, he wanted a bunch of officers to come back aboard. I, I don't know why. <laughs> why he did that. But anyway, other than the 704 of us, he brought back a bunch of officers. And these were people who had left the ship. Yeah, he told them to leave. And then when we, when we got, he found out he didn't have many officers left. So when we got back to Ulithi, he told them a lot, a lot of the officers to come back. Which we figured, you know, that's the same thing that happened to Loudon, only he got blowed off. And if, yeah. if the captain could bring his officers back, you know, why couldn't we sneak one of our buddies back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. But uh, like I say, he never did get over it. Did you keep in contact with him? I did for a while. When he got out, after he got out uh, a year or two later, I, I wrote to him a couple of times. He was in New York. And he got to be one of the chief engineers at Corning Glass. And uh, this other guy that was with me, we went over to pick him up at, at Pearl Harbor, uh, went to see him. and. He didn't want nothing to do with anybody that was associated with the ship. And that was the last I ever seen of him. <clears throat> but we have, right now, we have a reunion every year. We've had him in Carolina, down there on the carrier down there. We've had him in New York. Uh, a couple of years, three, four years ago, we had one in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine. That was another weird deal. <laughs> I 
I don't know if you want to get into that. But uh, when, when I was up at, at the reunion in Maine, uh, I had a stroke. Mm. And me and some of our friends were, were up on, I don't remember what mountain it was. There's a mountain there at Bar Harbor. And there's a restaurant up on top of it. And we went up there and we had lunch. And that's when I had a stroke up on the mountain. So he had his car there because he, he lived in, the, in the Rhode Island. And anyway, he, dro he had drove up there. And we uh, had uh, one. He drove us back to the to the. Uh, I think it was a Holiday Inn that we stayed in. In Bar Harbor. And when we got back there, they they took me to the hospital. And that was not a weird thing. <laughs> Everybody said there's no hospital here. You got to go back to uh, I don't know where it was Portland or someplace. But anyway, they put me in an ambulance and we went down the road a ways and pulled up to this little little building, and it was a hospital. And they took some uh, MRIs find out what had caused the stroke. And uh, well, I thought, you know, this is weird, this hospital. No, no, they said there was no hospital here. And it was a pretty good sized building. Mm -hmm. It was one story. And we went by all the rooms and there was nobody there. It was all empty. And, you know, this just don't look right. <laughs> <laughs> And after they discharged me, I come to find out this hospital was right across the road from Bush's house. It. Uh, oh wow. Yeah. Well, the Kennedys at at uh, Chappaquiddick and all mm -hmm. that stuff was right there, and all the top cats. I guess that was the. That was their private. Their, their hospital to go yeah. to if anything happened. It wasn't open to the public. I guess it was a government hospital. And you went there because it was an emergency yeah. and it was close. Yeah. And President Bush was supposed to <laughs> come over and say a few words at the reunion. And uh, when, uh, what happened? Oh yeah, he, he sent, a, sent a notice that he couldn't get over because he had uh, an appointment, a golf appointment with a couple of generals and an admiral, and he couldn't make it. But he sent us had, had a flyover for us, <laughs> and he flew over for the place where we stayed, and which was kind of nice. But that's as close as we ever got to Bush. That's about it, I guess. Okay. Anything else you need to know? Well, there's some questions I could ask you, uh, like um, about your time on the on the Franklin. What was it like to serve aboard an aircraft carrier? Can you talk well, a little bit about what it was day to day? Like I said, it was a, it was a big ship at the time. It was. 800 and some feet long. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't actually recall how many planes we had, but we had bombers and fighters and and uh, torpedo bombers. And we had up to, I think, 2,000 pound bombs was, a, was about the biggest we could carry. But, uh, the fighters and the bombers carried a lot of uh, 250, 400 pound bombs. That was basically what they used on their strikes, plus their fighter planes. They were pretty good fighter planes. 
And the last group we had was the Marine flying, they were flying Corsairs. And uh, the, uh, I heard, I don't know, I never did check it out, but uh, a couple of the pilots that we had were in that Papi Boynton's squadron. Black Sheep Squadron. After he got shot down, they, they broke his squadron up, and uh, a couple of them came over hmm. on the ship. In, in that tape, there's one, I think, I think I got three tapes on there. There's one that has uh, one, of the, one of the Navy guys. He was an officer. He took, took a lot of the pictures. And uh, he did a pretty good job on that. And then the other one was kind of like a newsreel. I don't remember who the guy was on there. He was a pretty famous broadcaster at the time. And then the last one was uh, the one with Gene Kelly on it. They made him a uh, honorary honorary member, crew member. And uh, he had a bunch of the guys from the East Coast that, was, that lived out in the New York area to uh, walk through the ship as they were dismantling it, they were tearing it apart. And a lot of the guys that that uh, was in this tape were guys that was, you know, that was on the ship and stayed with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got some, you, if you get a chance, take a look at that tape. <laughs> you can see what some of the guys said. And this one guy, he, uh, he, uh, well, one guy, one guy that's on there is Bob Blanchard. He's he's a guy that you know, always if you see a picture of Frank and the Father O'Callahan is up on the flight deck giving the guy his last rites. Mm -hmm. That was Bob Blanchard, and he comes to all reunions. He didn't die. Mm. They call him Chicken Bob because he got off the ship. <laughs> and uh, he was injured during the bombing. Huh? Was he? One of the people who was injured during the bombing. Oh yeah, he and was up, he was up on a flight deck, and mm -hmm. and O Callahan, the, the Catholic uh, chaplain, somebody took a the photographer took a picture mm -hmm. of him, giving the last rites to to him laying on the deck, you know, like he's he's dying, but he wasn't. That's what they call him, Chicken Bob. He got <laughs> off the ship <laughs> the hard way. And uh, Gene Kelly, like I said, he he goes through the whole ship with these guys, and they give a little story. Mm -hmm. Each one gives their story. And this one guy, he, he we had a lot of fires, really bad fires, and he uh, he about got his bun his lungs burned out, mm. just breathing real hot air. And uh, he was laying there, and, and uh, he was dying for some some water. And the only thing available was a spit tune. Ooh. <laughs> and took took a shot of water out of it. Ooh. And there's a lot of stuff we can talk all day about. <laughs> so but, you were, sorry, go ahead. Pardon? Did you want to? Well, one of, one of the things that happened is after we got hit and there was very few officers left, mm -hmm. the first thing the guys did was go down and hit the officers' liquor lockers. 
<laughs> the officers were allowed to have have a bottle with them any time and mm -hmm. had their own supply. And they went down and raided that, and then they brought that down to the fire room, and everybody was snapping a little joy juice there to take their mind off what was going on. <laughs> It, that's something, if you don't mind talking a little bit about it, um, maybe I could ask you some questions. If you don't want to talk about it, just say so. How did you... And uh, I didn't know that for a long time. That. Uh, he had lived here and he went to Urbana High School and graduated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that out and then I got an invitation that he's having his 80th birthday. He lives in San Diego. And he's, uh, her, his daughter is having an 80th birthday uh, next week. And he was going to be here and, and uh, said I should be sure to get over there. He, I don't remember where, where his daughter lives, but uh, we're going to go over there and look him up. He was the ship photographer, Ray Bailey. Are you recording? Okay. So the question I was going to ask you was um, on the ship after the bombings when you were part of that the 704. Yeah. Um, how did you get through that? How did I what? How did you get through it? How did you guys keep going? Well, like I say, I, I wasn't up on topside. Just about everybody that was up on a hangar deck and flight deck was killed. Mm-hmm. And I was on the fourth deck. My battle station was uh, a repair party on the fourth deck. And uh, I was right over number four fire room hatch. And we had, the problem we had, I don't want to get, get the captain involved in it, but we was not at general quarters when we got hit. And that is definitely a no-no when you're in a battle area to have all the hatch doors open mm -hmm. and they weren't, they weren't closed, they were open because he had told everybody to go. We was gonna go down and have breakfast in the morning chow. It was seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. when we got hit. And I mean, the, the cotton picking ship was blowing up for actually even the next day. It was, it was burning and blowing up for 24 hours before all the fires were put out. And it was pretty bad. <clears throat> and I was on my battle station. Well, I don't want to get into that. I'll, okay. I'll break down again. Okay. Right. Um, can you, you want to talk a little bit about some of your friends from the, the people that you knew on the ship? Well, if, if you read the book, uh, like the guy says, that it was narrating that they was probably 32, 3,300 people on the ship. Mm -hmm. And you could be on a ship for several years and never know half the people, mm -hmm. never even meet them. Yeah. Because everything was, everybody had their own division. They had one job to do and that was it. They didn't associate too much with the guys that was doing something else. Everybody had their specialty. And uh, 
he he put it all together there, and that's what he said too. That he never knew everybody on the ship. The only, now actually, the only guys I knew was the guys in the fire rooms, and a few of the guys in the engine room. But basically, the guys in our own fire room, which was number three fire room, was the guys you knew real well. You going on liberty with because you know they were your buddies. And uh, you knew of the guys in the other fire rooms, the number one and number two fire room. There was four fire rooms and two engine rooms. And uh, that was uh, an is interesting thing, too. And when, when we reprovisioned the ship, every time we'd come in, into port and reprovision all the food and, and munitions and stuff, and we'd have if we if we tied up at a dock, we brought all the stuff aboard, mm -hmm. and we usually got fresh fruit and vegetables and eggs and stuff like that. And uh, that they usually they was in a hurry to load, so they had everybody on board that wasn't on watch to reprovision the ship. In other words, unload the stuff off the dock or another ship and take it down to the storerooms. So, like I said, we was, I was in number three fire room. And the way they reprovision, everybody stands about three, four foot apart. You got a line all the way from the, from the hangar deck. You know, guys three foot apart all the way down all the ladders and everything else. Mm -hmm. And you just <laughs> throw the stuff on and the guy next guy grabs it and takes it on down, you know, just hands it to the next guy till you get it down to the storerooms. Wow. But the officers had their own mess. In other words, they had, you know, a little better stuff. Mm -hmm. And I th they had to buy their, their food. They, you know, it wasn't provided. They had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, they always got pretty good stuff. You know, they, they was making pretty good money. They didn't mind having good food. So we always arranged that right above number three fire room was a big hatch that went down to the fire room. So we always had a guy in the in the line, right over our fire room and over the hatch. So a case of eggs would come down, and it would just accidentally <laughs> slip down to the guy standing on the ladder, taking it down to the fire room. <laughs> a case of hams would come by, would snap it up, and down in the fire room. And it got so bad, the officers couldn't figure out what was happening to all their good stuff. <laughs> but but in the, on the ship, when we get down the fire room, like I say, it was on the bottom of the ship, we had steel plates above the bilges. It was about three foot, maybe four foot in some places, mm -hmm. between the plates and the bilges, which was the bottom of the ship. And we used to have a little water in the bilges occasionally, and we'd pump it up, but anyway, it would slosh around down in the bilges, but we'd, like we get a case of eggs, we'd pick up these plates, and we had baling wire, and we'd wire it to the, to the grates and put the plates back down, and it was hanging up underneath the plates, out of the water, in the bilges. And things were so bad that our engineering officer, Mr. White, who was back in number two engine room, we we had JV phones, and uh, he would he would call over to JV phones from the engine room and say, hey, uh, what do you guys got for breakfast? And we'd tell him, well, we got ham and eggs, and <laughs> we'd go up to the bakery, it was right above us. Mm -hmm. We'd go up there and have the baker give us two, three loaves of fresh hot bread and a pound of butter. And we had our own coffee pot. And we tell them, well, we got some ham and eggs left and some 
some uh, hot coffee ready to go. And he said, well, I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd come over. He said, this is better than when we get down in the mess, in the officer's mess. <laughs> so that was kind of, you know, a little thing that we had going. <laughs> And they never figured it out that it was you guys. Oh, the officers did. Oh, they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the, if our, our Lieutenant White, if he uh, kind of tipped the other guys off about it or not, but he was the only guy that ever come down and had, had breakfast with us or dinner, come down for a sandwich. But that was one thing we was handy right, right next to the, or below the, the uh, galley in the bakery. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, a lot of times we'd go out and hit, snap a couple loaves of hot bread and, and butter and take it down and have a pot of coffee. That was one thing we we uh, always had was a hot pot of coffee. What we did, one of the guys went up to the sheet metal shop up on the hangar deck <clears throat> and had had the guys at the sheet metal shop make us a coffee pot out of copper. Hmm. He had sheet copper and they soldered the thing together, which wasn't too good with lead. <laughs> oh. But they they soldered a, a great big coffee pot and it would hold probably fifty cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. That's all we drank all day long was coffee, hot coffee, and it was probably around. Uh, 110, 120 degrees down in the fire room all the time. Oh, my. But we were standing under blowers, mm -hmm. and it was cool air coming in from the outside. But to make this coffee, we get we get a pound of coffee and put it in this great big pot, fill it up with water, and the way we heat it, we'd go behind the boiler. They had uh, high-pressure drains back there. It blow blow the water out of the out of the steam lines, and we'd stick the the pipe down it. And it, it would blow off and go down into the bilges. We'd stick it, stick our little coffee pot under that, and open the thing up, and it would blow. You know, the, the steam was like 850 degrees. It's unbelievable how hot that steam was. You know. Normally, you steam is, you figure it's, you know, 212 degrees. Yeah. But this was, we had super, super heaters. We, the steam was generated in the boiler, and then it would go through the super heaters, and it, they call it ringing the, stream, ringing the steam out. They'd ring it out to eight, it was 850 degrees, that steam. Mm -hmm. And that's what we used to heat, heat our coffee. We'd put that pipe down in there and turn the thing on, and it would bubble up for a few minutes, and we'd have boiling coffee in just a few minutes. Wow. <laughs> a couple of gallons of it. And that was the way we had our coffee. But, like I said, they had that copper coffee pot with, that was soldered together with lead, mm -hmm. and we were shooting this boiler, boiler steam in it, <laughs> and this, the boiler water had boiler compound in it. Oh, great. To, uh, you know, keep the pipes yeah. from corroding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it didn't hurt anybody, I don't think. That's good. It sounds like uh, it could be very dangerous work, even if you weren't under attack oh, yeah. in the boiler room. But like I say, every division had their specialty. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I mean, they, everybody more or less kept it themselves. We didn't. We didn't have on an aircraft carrier. The people in the air air divisions. I mean, they were the top cats. I mean, it was. There was nobody else on the ship but the air divisions. I mean, that was a carrier. That's what they did. Yeah. Nobody even knew what the fire room was or the engine room. Wow. They <laughs> they go by in the chow line over over our uh, hatch going down to the fire room. We was down. What was we down? Three more decks blow the uh, galley and we had a hatch about oh maybe 20 inches 24 inches that we'd go down through we had the big hatch that they used to take 
machinery and stuff down, which was closed about 99% of the time, and just, just a small hatch would be open. And uh, that uh, that was, well, you know, what we go up and down out of. And the chow line went right by the, our hatch. Well, he went by the number three and number four fire room hatch. And if the hatch was open, of course, you know, real hot air was coming up out of the, out of the hole. And these guys from the, up on the deck, you know, I mean, they're up there in the fresh air, sunshine. They come down there and go by our fire room hatch and the mm. hot air is blowing out. And holy mackerel, what are you guys doing down there? <laughs> <laughs> How do you stand it? It was bad. How many, were you able to get up on, on deck every once in a while then? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, we get up there like in the evening, you know, especially mm -hmm. when, when we was on watch for four hours and off for eight and then on for four and off for eight. That's the way we did our day. I mean, that happened. You had to 12 to four and, or to four to eight or to eight to 12. And uh, it was the same routine every day. But. When normally when when we weren't on watch, we had to work. We had you know take care of the fire room and mm -hmm. do any maintenance work we had in the fire room or engine room. And uh, they kept you busy all the time. You didn't sit around. I'll tell you. And you didn't get too much sleep either, especially if you was in the battle zone. They had general quarters going all the time. Anytime it was a a plane that come by that they didn't know who it belonged to, or a submarine uh, warning picked up. That was another thing that was kind of weird. They had uh, sonar on the ship, you know, pick up submarines, the engines on the submarine. Mm -hmm. And they were real sensitive. So I don't know how it started, but anyway, down in the fire room, somebody started making rings. You take a quarter and hold it like this and tap it with a ball peen hammer on the edge and just keep turning it and tapping it and it would flatten it, flatten it out and you would get about a quarter inch thick ring. By the time you got it down, you know, where it would go on your finger, and you take it up to the machine shop and have the guy, one of the machinists up there, drill the center out of the quarter, and he had a, you know, a solid silver ring. Hmm. The old quarters used to mm -hmm. be silver. Yeah. And uh, everybody was banging out these rings. We had big hunks of steel down in the fire room, and the guys were going around tap, tapping these things. And all of a sudden, the captain passed the word, you know, there's some kind of noise going on. We're trying to figure out what it is, and when we do, you better not, <laughs> you better knock it off because it was lousing up their sonar. Oh. And because it was boom, 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 like that. It was tapping with the, with the ball peens. And they knew it wasn't any kind of machinery. It wasn't making that kind of noise, and it was intermittent. And uh, they got pretty excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> so we took the hint and quit making rings. And then when we, we occasionally we got to go over on the islands. We went over on uh, Anawetok and Manus Island. And we go over in our whaleboat. That in a we talk, actually was the rim of a volcano. The, the rim of the volcano, the islands that were sticking up, was the top of the rim. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, it was you know the volcano. It was like you know a couple hundred feet deep. And it was only one place where it was open that ships could come through, and it made a perfect harbor, you know, for ships. Mm -hmm. And we we got liberty on one of the islands in there. And they take us over in a whaleboat 
we had Port Starboard Liberty at the time, and uh, then get over on the beach, and we got two cans of beer and a salami sandwich. It <laughs> really got to live it up. <laughs> and I didn't drink beer, but I made a lot of money selling my beer to the other guys. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they was a Japanese ammunition ship that was sunk. It was, it was in, actually up close to the beach. It was maybe a hundred feet off the, off of the beach. Well, we was, we was swimming. And a lot of the guys used to swim out there and the thing had, the, the deck was below the water. The mast and the bridge and stuff was still sticking out of the water. But what you do, you could drive, go over to the hold we all had life jackets on, but you could swim out to it and go down in the hold, and there was all kinds of ammunition down there. It was like 20 millimeter shells and 30, 30 caliber stuff, and, and uh, everybody would go down and get a couple of souvenirs down there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this one one guy that from our fire room, he was a little guy, he was a Frenchman, and. Uh, he swam out there, well, we all swam out there, and he went down there, and he was a real a real good swimmer. And he got, a, I don't know how many, about five or six big 40 millimeter shells. And he stuck them down in his, in his shorts, in his trunks, and had them under his arm, he was swimming with one hand. But anyway, he jumped off the ship and started swimming back towards shore, and he went right to the bottom. <laughs> oh no! He had a little too much weight. <laughs> he had to jettison half of his stuff to <laughs> get it in. And the, the islands, a lot of them islands, <clears throat> they was planted with uh, coconut trees, and. All that was left was stumps about three foot high. The, the Navy had fired across them so often that they blew all the trees off and all mm -hmm. that was left was the stumps. And we had, uh, most of the islands had um, sea bees on it. They, you know, the sea bee was a construction battalion in the Navy. And they had little 50 gallon drums and they made windmills to sit on the drums, and they had an arm that went down with a, with a toilet plunger on it, and that's what they used for a wash machine. They sent them out on the beach, and all these little windmills going. Guys were doing their laundry. <laughs> and then they had another another deal there for beer. They had a, a 50-gallon drum with high octane gasoline in, and that gasoline was cold. And they'd throw their beer in there and a bottle of beer in there and it would keep it real cool, <laughs> even if it was hot out. Wow. I wouldn't have thought of keeping beer cold with cold yeah, gas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they had all different weird little stories. <laughs> so on the day you found, on, on the day that uh, you heard that the war was over, you were in Times Square. What did that feel like? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I know a lot of the guys are hollering, we'll never have to buy another drink. Every, <laughs> every place you went, you know, come on and buy a drink. <laughs> like I said, New York was a great place to be. And being there for both, both uh, Ends of both wars. It really it was great. You were which? Oh, for the VE. I mean, victory in Europe Day, and victory in Japan. You mean, or you said both wars? Yeah, the the European war yeah. was over first, okay. and uh, that's when we pulled into New York. You know, we they took us off the ship and put us in the barracks. Actually, it was a an apartment complex. I don't know how the government got a hold of it, mm -hmm. but we lived in there while we were in New York. 
But after you're in New York for a couple of months, it gets old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what I say after the war was over with. Hey, let's, let's go take a look at Europe. Mm -hmm. So that's where we signed up. We were supposed to go to La Harbe, France, but we never did get there. All we got to was uh, South, Southampton, England. We'd, we'd take a train from Southampton over to London and spend a liberty in London, which was nice. I mean, it, nothing really great. Everything was made out of stone and very few trees and, you know, in town itself. Mm -hmm. It was, I thought London was really barren. And as far as restaurants go, forget it. <laughs> and we stayed at a, at a uh, uh, what was it? Kind of like a YMCA that, you know, servicemen was, was staying in. <clears throat> there was no roof on the thing, and all the all the windows were out. And we slept on army cots, and we, we had an army cot and a blanket. And uh, if it rained, he was in trouble. But it was an old bombed out YMCA, I guess it was. I don't know. Not too good accommodations. Yeah, I expect that there were a lot of. Probably most most yeah, of the buildings in London, London were was in damaged. pretty bad shape. Yeah. There was a lot of areas that were really, really bombed out. Well, I think we're getting close to the point where they want us to stop. So I'll just ask you one more question, and that's um, uh, you've you've read some of the books about the USS Franklin, right? You, you mentioned. A couple of the ones that you, yeah, like I say, there, I know there's about four of them out. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're, they're big books. Yeah, one of them is a historical novel. The uh, yeah, I don't remember which one it is. I think it's Saving Big Bend. And the other one is about the Franklin and the Santa Fe. That's the ship that came up alongside of us and took took off the wounded and and. Uh, people that the captain told to get off. And uh, that other one, it's just uh, some pictures of the crew, you know, that's the one we looked at here. And uh, I don't know who wrote that or who got that one together. But we got a guy, I can't think what his name is now. He lives here in Illinois. He is, uh, he's, he wrote a book, it's, it's at press now, it's supposed to be out in, uh, in this fall. The name is Springer, I think. That Pardon? was the, Springer, I think that was the name that I heard. His name? Yeah. Might have been. I can't think of it right now. Oh. How? I got, I got a letter from him out there. Okay. He he asked me if I would, uh, you know, give him a story. And he, I had to sign a, a release strip thing, you know, that, well, it's something similar to what you guys got. And uh, I heard, I don't know how true it was, that... Uh, one of these other books, it got into detail about what this guy did. It's a, a historic novel was supposed to be. And uh, I heard that uh, there was some lawsuits on it. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't too happy to, to uh, talk to him. I talked to him later and, and uh, found out that uh, what I was going to tell him that several other guys had already told him that. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing I, I didn't want to get in trouble with, uh, which involved the captain. And uh, I never said nothing for 62 years, so I figured, forget it. Mm -hmm. it's, the damage is done, and it's not going to make anybody happy. <clears throat> what 
what's it like to have lived through something like that and then to read those books about it later? I'm sorry, I didn't. What's it like to have lived through, um, you know, your, your service on the Franklin yeah. and then to go back and read books about it later? What's well, it? I kind of like to and I don't like to. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I like to see if other people see it the same way I do. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of them to do. And a lot of them that thought, you know, the captain was really a great person. And uh, I never said anything because, you know, it would be negative to what some of the other guys said. And then as I, like I say, we've had reunions now every year since uh, there's not very many left. Last time, I think we only had, uh, well, at Pensacola, we were down at the Pensacola Air, Air Station in Florida. And uh, I think it was about uh, 40, people actually that was on the ship. And basically they're guys' wives or their kids or grandchildren that's keeping it going. In fact, the last newsletter I got, it says they're, they're, they're gonna start taking uh, kids and grandkids on the board uh, on our on our board, you know, for for the reunion, mm -hmm. uh, because the guys are getting pretty scarce, and uh, they'd be glad to get some of the, the grandkids and the kids to take over, which they have been doing for the last uh, probably ten years. The kid, their kids have been taking it over. <clears throat> like I said, next year we're having it in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But we've been all over the East Coast and all over the West Coast. Well, not really all over San Diego and uh, Seattle, Washington on the West Coast. <clears throat> we've had it here in Chicago three times, I believe. Yeah, the, the one we had in Chicago was a real nice reunion. It was good for us. We didn't have to tra travel very far. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, most of the guys were on, uh, came through Great Lakes, you know, and they, when they come through Chicago, most of, a lot of them was from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And all they did was jump on the train in Chicago and head, head home or, you know, wherever they was going. They, they never did get to see Chicago. And when they had it here twice now, uh, they were really impressed. <laughs> we took a little cruise on the river there and, and uh, down the Chicago River on that little, uh, what do they call it? It was a little, uh, I don't know what kind of a boat you'd call uh, it. The, the tour boats that they have, the double-decker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we went out on Navy Pier, and, and we stayed on Michigan Avenue there, at, uh, right across from the uh, John Hancock building. I don't remember what hotel that is, but uh, it was a, it was nice, right on State or State in Michigan, in that area. Mm -hmm. But. They seem, you know, even the, the kids uh, think it's pretty great. Most of them. Yeah. So, anything else that you want to say or add? Well. That we didn't cover, didn't talk about? Mm, not that I think of. Okay. Like I said, I'd like you to 
read those books are you can you can get them over here to the bookstore. Okay. Uh, what was that? Pages for all ages. In the, in the war stories part. I'd like to. And uh, now a lot of the guys. When, when the book came out, the author always came to the reunions before the, the book came out. And then after it did come out, he brought, you know, a bunch of the books with him. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I picked mine up. And then he signed the books. And uh, I had a lot of the guys that was there at the reunion to, to sign. I got Bob Blanchard, the guy that was laying on the flight deck. Getting his last rights, mm -hmm. <laughs> Chicken Bob, and uh, Ray Bailey. He's the guy that lives here in, in Urbana. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob St. Peter's. He lives down in Alton. We had we had quite a few guys here from Illinois. Actually, we got a guy from up in Chicago. Uh, I don't remember what. He's in a little suburb up outside of Chicago. And Bob St. Peter's is Alton, and, and the guy that's writing the book, he, he's in town I never heard of. I think he's up on the Mississippi up north of Walton. Springer. His name is Springer. Joe Springer. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I wish you could take a look at that tape. Give you an idea of wh what happened. <laughs> yeah, that should pretty well wrap it up. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This has been fascinating, and it's been a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. I'm glad to do it.